Great. Well, it is very difficult to um, say anything new about Darwin at this point, because we celebrated uh, the 200th anniversary of his birth, you remember, in 2009, uh, and a lot of uh, books and papers uh, came out at that time. So, it would appear that there is very little left. So, I'm not going to talk so much about Darwin, but I'm going to talk about Darwinism. And uh, Darwinism is, um, there is no standard definition, as far as I know, uh, because you can, you can look at the, the uh, evolution of the doctrine of Darwin in different ways. Uh, but um, I'm going to concentrate on uh, what we could call the young guard of Darwinism, a, a bunch of uh, young scientists that were um, in their 30s, 20s, uh, some of them a bit older, at the time of the publication of The Origin of Species in 1859, uh, that they were very intelligent people, very driven, um, and uh, in fact, it was due to them that uh, evolution um, came to be well known. And as you know, in the history of the theory of evolution, there was a period uh, coming up to the 20th century when uh, evolution, uh, as Darwin suggested, uh, the theory was, um, in the, was not very popular. And uh, Mendelism instead uh, was uh, gaining the upper hand. Although uh, in the maybe 1920s or 1930s, there was a reconciliation between two, the two doctrines and uh, now uh, they are they co co coexist, uh, coexist happily together, uh, genetics and Darwinism. Not only that, but in fact, um, Darwin um, had a theory, but he knew that there was a lot of uh, unknowns in the theory. He knew that it was very flawed, because the science of the time uh, did not help him. And he had to invent a very primitive uh, theory of genetics. He used theories of Lamarck and, and uh, other uh, people who were writing at the time or a bit earlier. Um, but that was not really very scientific. It was uh, um, very speculative and with no data, with no observations, with no scientific method. Uh, let me say from the start, in case I disappoint you, uh, I, I do think that uh, evolution is the right way of looking at things. Uh, that is not exactly, uh, my evolution is not exactly what uh, Darwin saw as evolution, because there's 200 years or 150 years in between, and uh, the sciences have changed quite a lot. So if only for that, uh, they have to be different. But the basics of what he said uh, is correct, I think, uh, from the point of view of the science. But as you will see today, uh, there was a lot more to the science of, of Darwinism. Uh, there was the fact that um, the people who received his doctrine in the first place were a cluster of very good and very close friends, and I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, because it occurs to me that uh, in order to spread a, a, a message, um, you cannot do it on your own, and you need good friends to help you and to support you. Uh, and that is what Darwin uh, found in these young men. Also, I want to uh, reflect a little bit about, not very much, but just briefly, about the, the political situation uh, at the time in Ireland and in the UK, um, which again, I think it helped the, the spreading of, of uh, Darwinism um, and the establishment of uh, those young men who supported Darwin uh, ideologically. Um, it helped to, to, to um, sustain them, uh, say, from the point of view of um, their drive to get jobs based on science. Um, the universities, as we will see, were changing very dramatically in the 1850s. Uh, and uh, Darwinism made use of those changes very um, 
efficiently to, to get key positions in certain places. Um, so, and then we will see um, a few things about uh, the, the role of religion in, uh, in the spreading of Darwinism. And the role of religion was mostly negative. Whether uh, Protestant or Catholic, and Protestant within uh, all denominations, really, um, although I think I have looked basically at uh, some people from the Church of Ireland and some Presbyterians, but they were agreed mostly that uh, Darwinism contradicted the Bible, and that was their angle on Darwinism. Anyway, so much for the introduction. Uh, let me go on. Yeah. So, um, Darwin um, w was well known in uh, the natural history world because uh, he was the son of uh, one of the Darwins, and the Darwins were a family of doctors and um, well-established in, in the UK, um, who wrote quite a lot, uh, very popular people, very wealthy people. Uh, so I was uh, looking at uh, whether the name of Darwin was uh, appeared in the papers, uh, say, in the London Times before 1859, and there's a lot of uh, references to uh, Darwin, uh, Charles Robert, uh, who's the man that uh, created the idea of um, evolution, but also to his father and even to his grandfather. So uh, he came from, from a well-known uh, um, uh, family. Uh, also, when he came back from the trip uh, on the Beagle, uh, around the world, he, um, he brought back enormous uh, quantities of uh, material to be classified. Fossils, rocks, sketches, uh, plants, animals. Usually he went to a place, he collected uh, as much as he could, he put it in crates and he left it uh, on the dock so that uh, the next uh, ship of uh, Her Majesty's uh, Navy would come, collect the stuff and bring it back to Cambridge. And in Cambridge he had agents who would open the crates and uh, distribute the material um, among scientists uh, who were w well known uh, around the world to classify the, the, the material. And then with, with all the data, uh, when he came back he began to write and to publish uh, books. Um, but that was a very long uh, period of time. And it wasn't that he was idle between the return from the Beagle and the publication of The Origin of Species. It is not that he was afraid. It, it is that he was busy. Um, so imagine five years going around the world collecting um, all kinds of material. Well, that obviously gave him a lot of work to do. Um, now, uh, the origin of species uh, in total, uh, in his lifetime, uh, was published in six editions. Uh, I think the last one was in 1879, I think. And in total, uh, he produced something like, he sold 16,000 um, copies. And uh, that refers only to the UK, because there were translations made into German, Italian, French, Spanish, um, and other languages um, very soon after 1859. Uh, so that those 16,000 copies cover uh, the UK only and a period of 20 years, which is quite long, um, and with, with all the translations. Uh, the translations are not counted in those 16,000. I want to m make the point that um, that, is not, uh, that was not exceptional for a Victorian book or even for a Victorian uh, natural history book. There were other books that were uh, much more popular and that were uh, putting forward uh, the, the ideas of natural theology as uh, the Protestant uh, Church of England saw them. For instance, um, Darwin himself 
had uh, studied uh, William Paley's uh, book on natural theology and was very interested by it. Uh, Bishop Butler had quite a number of uh, books and uh, papers as well on um, the connection between um, ethics and God and creation and so forth, uh, not touching on the idea of evolution necessarily. Um, so, and again, his books were very popular and very, uh, very well written and very readable. So, what, uh, how did uh, the book actually spread in, in, in physical uh, terms? In the first place, you have uh, this very Victorian phenomenon of the literary reviews, which were like the, the London Review of Books or the, um, one, uh, the American Review of Books or whatever, that, we, uh, that are weeklies now. Those began to exist in, in Victorian times. Some of them were monthly, some of them were quarterly, some of them were weekly. And they uh, began to make, um, at the time, people very keen to, to be educated, a bit like today. And the, um, the printing um, industry, uh, the publishing industry, was beginning to capitalize on, on that idea. So you have there a number of the um, most popular uh, quarterlies or magazines uh, that were uh, with the number of, of uh, issues per uh, month that they were published, publishing. And you see that, say, the Macmillan magazine, for instance, published 8,000 um, issues, 8,000 copies per month, and Huxley uh, who was uh, one of those young friends of Darwin, had a, a review of the origin there. Uh, the Athenaeum published 15,000 copies per month. Uh, the Quarterly Review, another 8,000. 8, the Edinburgh Review, another 8,000. The Saturday Review, a weekly that published 10,000 copies uh, per week. And they all looked at Darwin's book and they all read it and they all wrote reviews. The majority of them positive, some of them uh, not very positive or even negative. Um, now, look at um, the, the London Times, a daily. At the time, it was publishing something like 60,000 copies per day. And uh, Huxley, this young friend that I say that Darwin had at the time, uh, published um, um, review which obviously was widely read. So whatever Darwin, whatever powers of persuasion Darwin had or whatever value his doctrine had with regard to uh, explaining things, it wasn't so much himself uh, who spread the book around but it was his young friends who were reviewing the book in um, in the weeklies or in the quarterlies or in the monthlies, okay? Um, I want to make that uh, uh, say, you see, in, in just one day, uh, writing one paper, Huxley uh, reached many more people than uh, people actually read the, um, the book in the entire uh, lifetime of Darwin, okay? So that is um, peculiar. Uh, Darwin, sorry, um, Huxley, as you know, was called uh, Darwin's bulldog because he was a very strong personality and he defended Darwin uh, to the hilt. Um, and uh, there, there, was some, there was some good aspect uh, about that. We'll see about that later on. Now, with regard to the scene in Dublin, in Trinity College, we have two people that were very influential in um, stopping the spreading of Darwinism in, um, in Dublin and in Ireland. One of them was Samuel Houghton on the left there, uh, who was, um, if you have gone to the zoological gardens, you probably have seen the Houghton room. He was one of the first uh, directors of Dublin Zoo and um, 
He was he he was a great lover of animals. He did a, he did a, a degree in. He was a geologist to start with. Uh, he made a um, transition to medicine uh, when he was about thirty-five or forty, uh, and then uh, he began to direct the the course of um, the medical sciences in Ireland. But throughout the time, he was a, a very keen anti-Darwinian. And the reason for that is that he, uh, he was a mathematician. Uh, in his background was mathematics, uh, like many of the scholars in Trinity College. And he had come to the conclusion, studying the, the joints of many animals, he had come to the conclusion that in the joint of an animal, if you change the slightest part, the slightest piece of bone or the slightest muscle, and you make it uh, longer or shorter or thicker or thinner, the joint doesn't work so well. So he said, the joints in, in the vertebrates that I have seen are optimized. So he said, how uh, can evolution work if the minute you change a joint, the animal is uh, less, works less well. So, by the law of, of selection, as Darwin would say, uh, that animal would tend to be segregated and uh, would be um, overpowered, if you wish, by his uh, um, conspecifics who haven't got that change. So, he said, changes tend to militate against evolution and nature tends to be conservative. And he proved that uh, mathematically, uh, uh, very beautifully. And Darwin, who was no mathematician, didn't like that at all. And he, he hated uh, Houghton <laughs> um, uh, quite intensely. And uh, Houghton uh, had a friend here in college as well, uh, Joseph Allen Galbraith, who's the man on the right there. And uh, Galbraith was began uh, to be a naturalist, a bit like, uh, like Houghton. Uh, Houghton um, as I say, they were very good friends. They had a great influence one upon the other. In fact, uh, one of uh, Galbraith's daughters married one of uh, Houghton's uh, sons. Both of them were, were Protestant, uh, Church of uh, Ireland. I found that both of them were Masons. Uh, they, they, uh, they were co-founders of Logia 33, okay, and the records for that are in the, in the Masonic uh, house in uh, Molesworth Street. So uh, these were the, the main uh, opposition to Darwin in, um, in Dublin, and their effect lasted for a very long time, uh, opposing Darwin. So. Um, uh, this, I mentioned that these two people were um, Church of Ireland. Uh, in, in England, um, in 1960, uh, uh, sorry, in 1864-65, there was serious uh, um, upheavals and serious movements um, to try to um, make some kind of a, a law, uh, trying to get all scientists to sign a declaration saying that the Bible is the word of God and that science cannot do anything against the Bible, uh, which is a, a way of looking at things which is um, uh, not the way we would do things today, but at the time uh, it was um, as far as they could go. Um, but but that, uh, that movement failed and uh, scientists uh, did not, were not very interested in signing, and uh, if they signed, they were not very faithful to their commitment to the, to the scientists' declaration. I'm talking again about scientists in the Church of England and Church of Ireland. But uh, I believe that uh, something like 50% of all clergy in, in uh, England signed this, this scientific declaration. So it was, it was a very powerful uh, movement. Um, one thing that we have to appreciate uh, when we look at uh, the, why Darwinism was so attractive 
at the time is that there was a lot of um, strands from different sciences that were all going in the same direction. And that, that was to produce a unified theory of nature, a unified theory of the world. Okay? And Darwinism was going also in that direction. I mentioned there some of the, some of the principles. Uh, say in chemistry, for instance, you had the, the periodic table. The periodic table was beginning to, to be um, uh, the, the law of periodicity of the properties of the elements was begun, beginning to be discovered, little by little and with, with trial and error and so on. But people were beginning to put together the periodic table and where there were gaps, they were able to say there is an element which will have this and that characteristics that will, should be found somewhere. And a few years later, somebody was able to isolate the element and uh, confirm the theory very beautifully. So, uh, chemistry was uh, producing this uh, theory of the periodicity of the elements and the unity of matter. Uh, similarly, in, in physics, um, physic, the physicists were beginning to come to grips with uh, understanding a little better not definitively, but a little better. The, the nature of matter, they were beginning to, um, through um, clever mathematics, they were beginning to be able to uh, assess the, the effects of force on matter and so forth. Um, so, um, um, also, uh, uh, physics was beginning to be related to chemistry and to astronomy. The, the spectrum of stars was beginning to be read and people were able to identify the elements that they could see on the Earth. They could identify them on the light of stars that are millions of years away from us. So, as you see, uh, the, the perception was a, a great unity in nature. In geology, the, the big debate on the age of the Earth was uh, rampant at the time. And uh, up, to the, uh, up to the 1850s, and I have seen papers from the 1870s, people were writing that, uh, people were basing the age of the earth on biblical um, genealogies. So they said uh, 4,000 years of age, no more. But then uh, people began to see that that couldn't be the case, uh, that the, the, the earth was a lot older, and they were using um, some arguments that we don't uh, accept today, but they were interesting. Uh, they used um, an argument about the, the, uh, the um, cooling of the earth, and they found that the, for, the temp for the temperature of the earth to be what it is today, so many uh, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years had to have elapsed between the, the, the Earth having the temperature of the Sun and the Earth having the current temperature. So, um, more, uh, more uh, sciences that contributed to the view um, uh, current at the time. Biology uh, was uh, coming to um, conclude that the idea of gener spontaneous generation was untenable that uh, all uh, living matter comes from living matter and uh, that dead matter does not produce living matter, um, which is, which is uh, true to a certain extent. Okay? <laughs> we will see now a bit more about that. Uh, in anthropology, um, the, the age of man uh, had gone back many millennia in parallel to the increasing age of the Earth. So people said uh, the Earth now has maybe is, is 100 million years old. So man must be a lot older than the, a lot older than the 4,000 years that we thought he was in the past. Um, people were beginning to to chop up um, different parts of animals and see and compare the morphology and the mm, fine anatomy, the histology of animals with those of humans. And when it came to the brain, they came to the conclusion 
that uh, there was a, a unity uh, in the design of the brain that was preserved or that changed according to certain laws uh, between the animal kingdom and man. Okay, so uh, a lot of things there to make people think, well, science is one, um, the world is, uh, obeys certain laws that the scientists are uncovering now, and uh, evolution is one of those laws, okay? That natural selection uh, plays a role in creating new species uh, is part of this new view of the, of, of the universe, to which all sciences contribute. It is not just that Mr. Darwin, who's a, an amateur biolo biologist uh, who is, uh, lives in the countryside and so on, a bit like a recluse, it is not an idea that he had, and, uh, and uh, that's, that's the end of the story. You know? It is an idea that fits in very well with the entire progress of the other sciences. Now, let me introduce now, you probably know them already, but uh, just in case some of you don't, uh, let me introduce you to these young friends of Darwin that uh, were going around um, publishing his, his views. This is uh, Thomas Henry Huxley. You can uh, look at that mouth and look at those eyes. He was, he was a very determined man. He was very much, a, he was, a, a, if you wish, a proletarian, a kind of um, born in a poor family, but he scaled the, the heights of academia. He taught himself several languages. He went to uh, college uh, through his own, uh, well, he didn't go to college, but through his own, um, he did medicine, he did medicine, which at the time was uh, slightly non-academic subject, <laughs> uh, that, that came afterwards. Um, he was a naval surgeon, he traveled the world a bit like Darwin, and uh, he, he just, he, he read voraciously, he wrote uh, uh, very, uh, he was very prolific, and he spoke very well, and he wrote very well, and he was able to charm people to his arguments, and uh, those who he, whom he couldn't charm, he destroyed, okay? <laughs> Um, so, um, he was uh, uh, very keen to uh, give access to the university to young naturalists. Because at the time, okay, maybe physics, there was a discipline called physics, there was a discipline called geology, those were all disciplines, but there was nothing like biology. There was no chair of biology anywhere. Uh, and he was keen to, um, to create chairs of biology, chairs to explain um, how living matter works from physical and chemical principles only, that is physiology. Um, so, and he was able to, he was very influential um, capturing um, budgets or parts of budgets from the, the um, government at the time in, in the UK, from the departments of education, for teaching science. All these people that I'm going to mention now, one of the features that they have is that they were all very keen educators. Uh, and they, 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 the only, on, they only wanted to educate people in science, to the exclusion of everything else. Darwin was devastated when uh, his son had to learn Greek you know, he said, well, the, he's, going, he's going to do ethics next or whatever, you know, and he's not going to do science. He's not going to do mathematics. He was very disappointed. Okay, so Huxley, brilliant man. This is uh, perhaps somebody who's less well known, uh, Joseph uh, Dalton Hooker. And he was, at the time, the, the, at the time of the uh, publication of The Origin of Species, he was the director of uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, in London. And he, uh, from 1850, 1851 onwards, he was uh, Huxley's best friend. Um, he, he traveled the world collecting plants, and at the time plants were, were very important. 
uh, think of tea, for instance, think of rice, think of um, the rubber plant. Um, uh, th those were uh, prime, materi prime matter for a lot of the um, technical uh, evolution in Europe, technical uh, progress in Europe. In a way, for instance, all, the, all the, the submarine cable that facilitated the telegraph between Ireland and Europe and the States was, a bay, was possible because they found a, a processing uh, of rubber that made the, uh, very long tubes that were, were waterproof and that, were, that could be joined together in, in miles of piping. So that was what actually brought the cables down through the, the Atlantic Ocean to, to America. So he, he was very involved, not just in, in the theoretical aspects of botany, but in the practical aspects of botany. He was very rich, as opposed to Huxley, who was very poor. Although Huxley, as I say, did, began to do well very early on. Uh, he was very generous, he was, he was a laugh a minute, the, the um, letters to Darwin and to Huxley from Hooker, they all are peppered with great sense of humor. Uh, now, perhaps the last of uh, the friends that uh, were influential with Darwin and to spread, to spread the, the message of Darwin was this man, John Tyndall. Um, he was from Carlo and he was a physicist. He was a brilliant physicist. Uh, he was the, the follower of uh, Michael Faraday in the, in the Royal Institution in London. He was a great teacher. And every Saturday evening, uh, in a hall maybe four times as big as this, he mounted big experiments in front of a big audience of very distinguished people, and he could perform experiments live, you know, that were uh, they were enthralling for the people who attended. Anyway, he, he was, um, he's a very interesting man because I'm not sure if you remember this or if you ever knew it, but in, nine, in 1874, he was the president of the British Association for the Advan Advancement of Science. And as president, he had to give a, the presidential address in, in uh, that year. And in, 19, in 1874, it was in Belfast that the, the association met. And he gave a really explosive speech uh, in Belfast, uh, opposing a science and religion. And saying, uh, uh, he, had, he did, the, the talk lasted for maybe two and a half hours. Everybody was exhausted at the end. And he was, he, he, these men were made of iron, you know. He was in full flight still when the, when the talk was about to finish. And um, so he did a history of philosophy uh, in those two and a half hours from, from the Greek materialists, uh, um, um, uh, Lucretius, um, um, okay, the, the Greek and the Roman materialists, and then he skipped the entire Middle Ages and he went directly to Descartes and so on and so forth. So um, he did a very biased review of philosophy saying, look, uh, materialism is the thing, you know. Um, and he, he mentioned all the things that I said before about um, the unity of science and the, the, the unified theory of the universe, if you want. And he said, matter is what explains everything. But uh, I have to say, he said that, but when it came to man, uh, he stopped. And I think that this is because he, he was a great um, alpinist. He was a great climber. He had a house in Switzerland. And he went there every summer. And he was ecstatic about the beauty of the landscape the beauty of the snow, the beauty of the, the clouds and the sunrise and sunset and so on and so forth. And he said, well, there's something in man that appreciates beauty that, in my opinion, no science can explain, no matter can explain. And he left it through that uh, kind of point of contact between science and, and, and the human being. He left the door open 
for the spirit. So uh, the reaction to, um, to his Belfast address in 1874 was as violent as his speech had been. So all the, all the Protestant divines in every single church in Belfast um, on the following day wrote uh, letters to the papers, began to write books, gave talks. It was a very violent reaction saying, this man has gone beyond science and that is, that is not legitimate, okay? So I, I have a weakness for this man because I think I understand him very well. Uh, I think he, he, he probably, uh, he was not so much a, a, an atheist, but perhaps a bit more of a pantheist. And, uh, and even within that, he was open to, to the idea of God. And I'm looking at the last years of his life, when he made contact with a number of people, including a, a priest from France called, uh, we'll, we'll see him anyway, um, who was trying to convert him. And it's very nice to see in the letters how the priest is trying to convert his, his learned colleague, you know. We'll see more about that in a second. So all these men were very attractive. Uh, they were self-made men. They were extremely hardworking. In fact, all of them uh, got um, the, the, some kind of depression or something at some stage in their life because they were working so hard. And funnily enough, um, the concept of friendship that they had was um, very solid. And say, for instance, Huxley, who was married with, with several children, um, his friends, including uh, Hooker and Darwin and Tyndall, uh, got a subscription for something like three and a half thousand pounds at the time to send him on a holiday to Egypt. And they were, looked, were looking after his children while he was recovering. So um, they were great, very hardworking, very good friends among themselves. Um, they had very high moral standards, uh, married to one woman, uh, f uh, loving fathers of their children. Um, fantastic to see all those things testified in their letters, you know. Um, they were happy fighting men, yeah, they were very articulate, uh, they were loyal friends, and they, w they said, we, we seek the truth. We don't accept that the truth will be imposed on us as a dogma from on high, but we go out to uncover the truth wherever it is. And when we find the truth, we accept it. So that made them uh, very appealing. And people knew this. So, yeah, I mentioned the reaction from Protestant people, uh, uh, Anglicans and Presbyterians, about the, the Belfast Address. Uh, from the point of view of um, the Catholic reaction, uh, you have there on the right uh, this man that was... Uh, he translated Tyndall and he translated the Belfast Address from English into French. He translated many other works of Tyndall, uh, but he was a Catholic priest and um, he is the one who was trying to convert him. Okay, um, I, I'm not terribly clear, he, he didn't succeed in a, in a blatant way, but as you read Tyndall's letters as he was getting older, and began to see death coming closer. He is a different man, um, which I suppose will happen to all of us. Um, so, and these two other people, uh, Cardinal Colin and Bishop Moran, um, both went from, were from Carlo, and this is very peculiar. Tyndall was from Carlo, Moran was from Carlo, and Colin was from Carlo, uh, and uh, Delaney, uh, who, was, who was instrumental in funding University College Dublin, a Jesuit. He was also from Carlo. Somebody, some people say that there's some special <laughs> air uh, going around Carlo that makes people very intelligent. <laughs> um, anyway, so these people uh, oppose Darwin in, in, a, in a very rudimentary way, in a way, you know. Let me see. Um, The, the Roman Catholic reaction to the 
um, Belfast speech by Tyndall, where obviously he, he, one of the things that he did was to propose uh, Darwinism. Okay? But um, um, Catholics, after that speech, were confirmed that they needed a Catholic university. They had um, they had the little experiment that Tyndall, uh, sorry, that uh, Cardinal Newman had made in Dublin, but it wasn't very successful. So they said, look, we want something that the hierarchy will run uh, only for Catholic people, and um, that we design the curriculum, that we decide what we teach and what not to teach. Certainly, we will not teach evolution. Um, so th that was the way they reacted. And they said um, they were unable, because it wasn't developed then, it wasn't their fault, but the church in general was unable to oppose a coherent exegesis to Darwin. Uh, the, the exegesis at the time was uh, literalism, and that doesn't go anywhere. Uh, so, and the, the exegesis that we have now due mostly to um, uh, Benedict XVI and uh, John Paul II, that beautiful reading of the book of Genesis, and that beautiful idea of uh, Christ being the model of man, if you wish, so that Christ was made first and uh, was conceived, you wish, first, and the idea of man came after the idea of Christ, if you wish. Um, People, uh, obviously, th that idea was not around at the time, uh, and it'll take a long time to, to come through. So, um, uh, they, they, were, they were reactionary, I'm afraid. They were opposed to the idea, but very close to the idea as well, okay? Uh, they were not um, able to dialogue with it. Um, okay. A point that I want to make here also is that the Roman Church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, never condemned either Darwin or Darwinism by name. Uh, or it never has, uh, in Pius the, the Ninth, Pius the Eleventh, uh, Pius the Tenth, they never condemned uh, Darwinism or Darwin. And Pius the Twelfth began to suggest that there could be a reconciliation or a meeting of minds somewhere. And now we know that that is probably the case. So, another point that I want to make. I think that in the spreading of Darwinism, the business of their friendship, the, the friendship of this uh, cluster of people that were around Darwin, was essential. And I want to make the point, because it has been made uh, to do with Newman, I want to make the point that in pre-Freudian times, uh, Freud was born in 1856, okay? So his doctrine didn't come until well into the 20th century. But in pre-Freudian times, uh, men were able to express uh, their, um, their affection and their friendship to other men much more fearless, fearlessly than we do now. And they were friends, uh, and they were married people, they had big families, they, had, they were very intelligent, they were working in the university, public men, but they express their friendship uh, very openly. Uh, I'm sure that if, if some of those sentences that, that uh, Tyndall and uh, Huxley exchanged between them, or with da even Darwin, or with, with whoever it was, Hooker, uh, those uh, would qualify um, people today as, Ooh, don't go near them, you know? Um, but uh, in that time, that was I say that because, as I say, uh, it has been, something like that has been said about Newman. And somebody has said, oh, Newman perhaps a bit of a homosexual, you know? That is stupidity. Because the culture at the time was, uh, they, were not, um, they were not under the spell of uh, Freud or psychoanalysis that we, uh, we have been. Uh, so they, they expressed their, their, their affection with simplicity. And it, it is beautiful to see that in their correspondence, not only in the correspondence, but in the facts of their life. So uh, that makes me think that these people uh, were 
not all that bad, you know. There were, there were human beings that were worth their salt. They were uh, fantastic people. Um, now, one thing that has to do with, uh, with politics, the education politics, um, and with the distribution of money and allocation of resources and all that kind of thing, is the business of the X Club. And the X Club was a meeting of those nine characters that you have there. Some people say that the tenth, which was the X, the tenth character, the tenth member of the club was Darwin. But he never attended the meetings. He was too old and too ill all the time. Um, so uh, you see there uh, Tyndall, Hurst, uh, Franklin, who was the, the founder of modern chemistry, Huxley, Hooker, Lobock, who was a big banker, Spencer, a philosopher, Spottiswood, a printer, Bosk, who was a, a, just a retired um, naval uh, surgeon. All those people were um, at the top of British science for a very long time. And they were able to, they were in key positions to open the door to people that sympathize with Darwin and with his ideas and so on and so forth more than the truth of Darwinism in itself, okay? Now, just one, uh, another little point that I want to make is that uh, in 1850, another thing that uh, took place is the replacement of the privileged um, um, method of uh, covering jobs for the civil service in England. Uh, the replacement of that for, the, for merit. It was privilege, the original method of filling jobs versus merit. And in 1850, a law was passed by the parliament saying, from now on, uh, people who want to go to the India civil service and to the civil service in the UK and so on, they, instead of being uh, the son of some such duke or count or such family and so on and so forth, what, what they have to do is just pass an exam, okay? So uh, that, uh, that was very important because that changed the role of universities. Uh, universities began to increase enormously in numbers of uh, intake of people and so on, and therefore en uh, numbers of teachers were increasing enormously as well because uh, of this replacement of the privileged method by the merit method of filling jobs that was the, the institutional um, procedure. Okay, I'm going to leave that for a second. But look at, um, look at the number of students in Trinity College, number of entrants by, by year, okay? So uh, something was happening uh, around the 1800s that uh, the number trebled from a little more than, a little less than 100 uh, uh, before 1800, 100 entrants, to something like three or four times that number after 1800. And that is, that was caused by this change uh, of the policy of intake um, of uh, new civil servants and new teachers. So the universities began to see themselves as uh, something that could sell itself, okay? Um, and therefore, um, universities in principle have been run by the churches. Trinity College by the Church of uh, England, uh, Church of Ireland, uh, in other places, uh, Louvain and so on, the Catholic Church. Um, but now the churches were being relegated because people who had the knowledge to teach those new subjects and new disciplines and so on were lay people. So the, the, the influence of the churches and the universities began to decay and the influence of the scientific men began to increase. Again, Darwinism goes without saying in the, mel in the, in the, in the melting pot and they, they, they win the day for that reason. Um, Okay, just uh, to mention that it was around that time in 1864 that the journal Nature was created precisely by Huxley and the Darwinians, a weekly uh, science magazine 
that it is still very influential, it is read all over the world, and uh, you switch on the media, and very often you hear uh, or see quotations from nature uh, about scientific um, developments. Well, nature had, again, the philosophy and the mind of the Darwinists, because Huxley and Tyndall were the, the, the founders, if you wish. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've said this. I have said this already. Um, yeah, I think I have gone through all of those things. Um, with the with the increase in the universities, um, the churches lost uh, their contact uh, to some extent, and uh, science began to um, be much more influential also with the government, with contractors. Imagine that you, you invent a, 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 an instrument, a saccharimeter or something, that could be used in all hospitals in the world. You know? Well, people were very keen to, uh, to buy the patent uh, from you to, to uh, manufacture the, the product and sell it all over the world. So the scientists uh, had a, a finger on, on markets and so on. Um, to make them uh, influential. Um, one thing I say here about the churches, uh, do I? No. Okay, it comes here now. My conclusions, about, uh, I, have, I realize that the talk is a little bit haphazard because I, I, I was trying to put together something new and maybe I haven't uh, completed the job, but I'm getting there. <laughs> um, so, um, my conclusions are these. The, the causes for spreading the spreading of Darwinism in the late 19th century are complex. Um, it was a hypothesis, uh, but it, not, it was not scientifically verified. So people had to buy on the hypothesis uh, without the proof. They bought on the hypothesis because it made sense in the general uh, trend of the sciences and so on and so forth, but not because they saw any proof or because Darwin or Huxley or anybody else could provide a proof. That came a lot later. Um, Darwin's friends, with their scientific agenda, did much to replace the influence of the church. Uh, we have seen that just now. Uh, I would question the atheistic label stock uh, on many Darwinians. They were not uh, atheistic. I think they were, they were two things. They were opportunistic and they found very convenient to set up this straw man as usual, the church as superstition, the church as uh, imposing power on ignorant people and so on and so forth. They found that useful to advance their own position. Um, the churches could not oppose a convincing exegesis uh, of Genesis, and I mentioned that. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was saddled with ignorance, with fear, and with doctrinal underdevelopment. And uh, say, you could say that, unfortunately, in the middle of the debate about science and so on and so forth, in 1871, the First Vatican Council comes up with the dogma that uh, of papal infallibility, okay? So in a way, was handing the, the message uh, on a plate to the Darwinians, because they say, we are the guys that discover the truth by the effort of our brains. We go out there and do things, do experiments, and we discover the truth, while the churches impose the truth on people and they don't let them think. And that appeared to be what the church, the Roman Catholic Church was doing uh, in Vatican Council I, okay? The Pope has the last word on, uh, on uh, and can define dogma. Obviously, that has to be read, but you can be sure that they misread it. Um, and in the churches, and the, the balance uh, piety doctrine was very skewed, and certainly in Ireland, it occurs to me, the, the balance was a lot more about the developing uh, the development of piety in people rather than the developing the development of 
um, mind and critical spirit and uh, doctrine. So, as you see, it, it is my view that for all those complex reasons, uh, Darwinism made progress uh, so rapidly at, ex at the expense of uh, the doctrine of the church, which was slow in coming. That's it.